to step uh, into our webinar to talk a little bit about ACC cleaning and leak detection. Over these many years, we have seen many more ACC units come into play being built, and we have gotten a lot of experience working in this particular area. So let's get started to get through here. First of all, let's talk a little bit about an air cooled condenser. You know, one of the issues that we run into in an air cooled condenser is it's not as efficient as a steam surface. It's sometimes more expensive in many areas, in many instances, and the area needed to build one of these is quite extensive. But there are some practical applications and uses. One, water issues and availability. We run into many plants that want to expand their plant and when they want to add another unit, they find out that they cannot get the water license in order to build a steam surface condenser. The availability isn't there. They run into uh, regulations with EPA or some environmental issue. And so therefore, an ACC unit is a practical way to go. Maybe it's the plant location. If you're putting the plant in a place where you're trying to optimize the use of the power that is available. And so it may be out in a desert area. There may not be any water within miles. And it's so difficult to get the water there that the application provides itself for an ACC unit. Or maybe you run into some local ordinances, maybe some citizens' complaints or some other issue, state ordinances, where the ACC unit is the answer uh, in those particular applications. Now, when we talk about the air cooled condenser, there are a couple different designs, but this is pretty much the basic one. A-frame construction where you have thin tubes running up the side, the steam header at the top, with large fans at the base underneath the A-frame. The basic thought process is the fans run, pull the air from underneath, blow it up through the fins of the ACC unit, and that condenses the steam. And so the methodology behind this is that as the steam flows down the panels, the fins themselves dissipate the heat from the air flowing between them, and thus you get that condensing unit. So it's critical that that airflow exists and that it is unimpeded. One of the other things to remember about ACC units, and we'll bring this up multiple times, is that they are outside. They are outside in the elements, and you have some lengthy and large piping. Some of it is steam piping, some of it is condenser piping, uh, exhaust piping, and it is all prone to air and leakage. In many instances, more prone than the steam surface condenser because it is outside and going through all the uh, temperature derivations from season to season. Now, here's a couple pictures of the ACC unit. If you see the one on the right-hand side, that's a smaller one. You can see there's two steam headers up there up top. Uh, this gives you an idea of the size of the unit itself on a small ACC. But I want to point out one thing in this picture that I always like is to give you an idea of where it is sitting and what can be brought into that unit as those fans run. You can see that there are some graveled areas. It's that reddish area that you look like around the ACC unit. And then you've got a road, and you've got dirt, and you've got some brush and some grass and possibly some trees. All that area that has debris on it is now susceptible to those fans pulling that air in and possibly pulling in that debris, blowing it up through the fins themselves. Now, ACCs run into some other interesting problems because if you look at that picture and you look at the steam coming out of the headers up top, or you can see that the smoke is going in one direction. So ACC units also run into problems with wind shear. So they've got wind issues. How is the wind blowing? Where's the wind blowing from? What's the temperature that that wind is blowing? And how does that affect that ACC unit? The one on the left, a little bit bigger unit, you can see that's three steam headers if you look off to the left. I like this picture for two reasons. One, it gives you an idea of how tall they can be. That truck in the foreground there gives you an idea of just how tall that doggone ACC unit is in comparison to a truck. Also, you can take a good look at this and see all that piping, the steam header and some of that piping underneath the unit, all exposed to the weather conditions, whether it be 120 outside down in Nevada or whether you're going up in the Northwest in the winter and hitting minus 30 degrees. This is a typical setup. 
the unit is high into the air, and to get the equipment up there to do the cleaning or to do the eddy, uh, leak detection, you have to have some method. In this case, it's a JLG that we are able to use to lift up to the top of that unit. Now, if you look at the very top of the picture, you see the person overlooking, standing on that walkway. You can see how big these units are and how big those fans are. And so, got to get that equipment up there. It gives you an idea of the amount of space in the area that you've got to traverse in order to get these units clean and to find leaks. Keep this picture in mind when we talk a little bit about leak protection. The other point I want to bring up for those of you that have ACC units is the equipment that is under the ACC. Keep in mind that when you do a cleaning, you're going to have a lot of water coming down there. So you want to make sure that that equipment is capable of handling that amount of water and also capable uh, of being cleaned off if necessary. So air-cooled condensers, let's talk a little bit about them. What's some of the problems that you run into? Well, air has a low thermal conductivity. What's that mean? It means that water will dissipate heat better than air. It'll, it'll dissipate heat in a more efficient fashion than air. And so we've got to have a lot more air running over these fins to dissipate the same amount of heat as we do water. Thus, the ACC unit is much larger. Air's got a low density, unlike water, and it's got a lot of heat capacity. So it's not quite as efficient. So that is a drawback. Another drawback is when this unit is going to be asked to run at its peak efficiency, which is going to be in the summer months, we actually suffer an energy penalty. Because as the air temperature increases outside, we lose some of that ability to transfer that heat from the steam surface into the air itself. And the third big issue, it's got an exposure to the elements. And that's all the different types of elements, water, snow, you can have the rain, you can have the heat, you can have the cold weather, you have the contraction and the expansion of the metal as the seasons wear on. And that can wear and tear on the condenser itself, and it can impact the efficiency of the unit over a period of time. So these are all things that you've got to keep in mind whenever you have these units and when you're trying to make them operate in their fleet efficiency, which brings us to the following tendencies. And if you think back just two slides where I showed you that one air-cooled condenser, how it was sitting out by itself, and how you had all that land around it with the leaves and the dirt uh, in the area, all of that is being pulled into those fans and blown up through the fence. Now, if you are in the Northeast, in other parts of the country, you know that in the spring you can walk out and sometimes write your name on your car because of all the pollen that has been that's in the air and that settles on the car. Well, that pollen, which is sticky to begin with, can be pulled in by those fans and then is blown up through those fins. But as it goes through the fin, it begins to attach. And as it attaches to those fins, it reduces the ability of those fins to be cooled. And so you're losing some of that heat transfer. Dust then comes up and attaches to the pollen or plants itself in between those fins, leaves, insects, bird carcasses, plastic bags, anything on the ground that's loose over a period of time can be brought up through those large fans and pushed up into the fins. And if you look at that picture on the bottom right there, you can see what happens over a period of time. The fins, which are really tight together, begin to collect the pollen, the dust, the pieces of leaves, the dirt, and they begin to plug. Now we're beginning to limit the amount of air that is available to go through these fins. So we've got a problem. Here. We've got this problem that air is not as efficient as water in producing or transferring the heat, and now we are limiting how much air can go through the unit itself. And on this picture here, you can see what happens over a period of time. Now, if you look up into the upper right-hand corner of that picture, you can see that air is going to get through there. They are foul. Maybe we are limiting how much air can get through there, but we are going to get some. But if you take a look more toward the center bottom part of that picture, those things are completely plugged. 
So now that airflow has actually stopped and you have lost all the ability to dissipate heat through those fins. So we've got a problem. Not only are we having inefficiency in the air itself, but now we've got all this fouling mechanism in these fins, which prevents the air from even being effective at all. Now, also in the summer, we run into some situations where we have that energy penalty. Air temperature gets quite hot in order to try to make sure that the unit is working uh, in an efficient manner or the most efficient manner possible. We go out and we spray those fins with water. But whatever's in that water is now going to scale out on those fins. And this is an exaggerated picture, but you can see what happens. They scale up. So now not only do we have debris and following between the fins, which is limiting the air, but now we've got scale on the fins also, with fins, which really becomes a problem as far as removing all the debris in the air uh, in, in the following so that the air can get through those things themselves. So what happens? Now we get a very poor heat transfer. We've got all this being into play. We're getting a poor heat transfer. We're not transferring all the heat into the condensate. And we're, we're, leaving a, we're leaving a lot of it that is non condensable So we get higher operating costs. Most of these fans, these large fans, they are running on variable speed drives. And so when that variable speed drive senses a higher differential, it begins to ramp up the fan itself. So now we've got these fans running at a higher pitch. We're drawing more power from the plant itself to run the fans. And don't be surprised if you don't also have problems mechanically, because now we're creating more pressure under the unit, we're creating more vibration on the unit, and we're creating more pressure on the fans themselves. So not only are we having higher operating costs, we're now going to increase our maintenance costs as these fan motors begin to increase. That leads to the deterioration of turbine back pressure. And in the long run, we get a restricted megawatt output. And we do run into many situations where plants tell us in the middle of summer, well, we had to cut back on our power output because we just couldn't maintain the back pressure that we need. So the best way to maintain peak performance is to ensure that the fins are free of fouling in the boot. Very difficult task because this happens year-round, all the time. You have a different type of fouling, pollen maybe in the spring, maybe you have dirt, and you have uh, debris in the summer, and then you've got the leaves in the fall. But it's critical to try to maintain as clean a tubes as possible. And on some instances, a vacuum steam system, a 20% reduction in airflow can actually increase turbine back pressure by 23%. So you can see how that interacts. And you want to make sure that that reduction in airflow uh, does not get to a point where you have a, such a high turbine back pressure that you're losing megawatt capacity. So how do we go about cleaning these fins? How do we go about doing it? Well, there's three basic ways to do it. You use a fire hose, you can use a high pressure hand lance, or an automated cleaning machine. So let's take a look at all three briefly. The fire hose. This was used for many, many years high volume of water, but it actually has a low washing effect. We're utilizing the weight of the water to try to drive the fouling out between those fins. The closer you are to the fins or the area that you're cleaning, the more pressure you can have, the better cleaning you can, you can perform in that area. But as you begin to move the fire hose up, you begin to shoot further away, the weight of that water sometimes just compacts what's already in there. And you're now creating an effect that's worse than the way you started. You're going to get rid of all the loose sediment, but everything that's packed in there can become even more powerful. The unit's got to be taken out of service, and scaffolding's got to be erected because you've got to drag this fire hose up the entire length of one of those panels. So you've got to be able to go up the scaffolding, you've got to go up the ladder and drag the hose with you. And what does that do? Not only does that make it difficult to do, but it also increases your ability for an accident. Your safety goes up. You've got to watch your safety factor so that the person that is operating the hose 
is not put in a position where they could have an accident of some sort or possibly damage the tubes if you drop the fire hose. So you've got to make sure you've got scaffolding erected, which makes it more expensive, and you've got to take in any safety of things. And in the long run, your improvements are small because you've only removed a portion of the uh, debris itself, but a lot has now become more compulsive. Now, the high pressure handling is a little different. It's a low water consumption, but at a much higher pressure. If I can keep the angle perfectly straight, perfectly level with the fins themselves, I can do a pretty good clean. I will admit that that'll work pretty well. But as soon as I begin to move that wand and I begin to change that angle, I lose not only the ability to drive the fouling out of the tubes, but I now begin to impact the tubes themselves. I can impact them from the standpoint of removing the galvanized layer on the tubes, or if the pressure is high enough, I can damage the tube. And you don't want that to happen either, those fins, as they will bend over. The unit, again, has to be taken out of service, scaffolding the record, because the person using the hand lamps has to go up the scaffolding and up the ladder, and once again, we bring safety into play here. And with, as in with the fire hose, the improvements are small. Where you can maintain that angle perfectly, you're going to have some nice improvements. And as soon as you change that angle, you're going to lose the effectiveness of that particular hand lamps, and you're not going to have much effect at all. Which brings us to the automated cleaning machine. Now, an automated system sets itself up, and we have some pictures of this, that it can run up and down the spine, and it can deliver water at a pressure that won't damage the tubes, but can be ratcheted up to 1,500, 1,700 PSI if needed, but maintains the angle needed in order to remove the debris and not affect the fins themselves. You can have fins that are two, three, or four rows deep. And in those situations, you need to have the pressure of that water being driven down through all the fins, all layers of those fins, in order to make sure that we get all the debris out of the unit itself. So what happens is that as you move this nozzle beam up the tube bundle and maintain the geometry with a constant jet angle, you are able to remove all the fouling in the tubes. And you can run this as a one pass or a two pass or a three pass if needed and still be able to clean the entire unit out the need of scaffolding because the unit is set up and able to transverse your entire unit. The nozzle design is adjustable, so you can determine the flow that you want and you can determine how the spray hits those tubes based on your particular configuration. And the carriage moves at a constant speed. And where does that give you an advantage? Well, that means that the entire unit gets cleaned in a thorough manner, so you don't have one section of the air-cooled condenser getting a better cleaning than another. Fouling gets removed effectively and uniformly throughout the entire unit. Now, here's a picture of it. This is the computer-driven carriage. You can see in this particular instance, there are six nozzles per row, two rows, so 12 nozzles. You can see that the spray on those nozzles almost looks like a teepee in this instance. But that can be changed. You can alter that based upon your particular configuration. You can also alter the pressure that is needed to drive through those tubes. And it runs up and down that beam. So as you start at the bottom and work the way to the top, it's a constant flow up and down the unit itself. Now here's another picture. Taking a look from the side, you can see the beam. You can see how it makes its way up and down the tubes, and as it reaches the top on a single pass, you can then slide the unit over and bring that carriage back down to the bottom. You don't have any problems with safety nets. You don't have any problems with people having to climb up and down that unit while it is running, and you can run that unit up and down that beam as many times as you need in order to have an efficient cleaning of that particular unit. How do you know you're getting the job done? Well, you walk on underneath the A-frame itself. And when you walk underneath that A-frame, you will see the water jets coming through the fence. And this is what you should see. 
you should see pressure coming through. The water should still have some force as it exits the A-frame itself, as it exits those fins. And it should come out one to two feet before it falls down onto the unit itself. If you just see a dribble of water and you are not getting any pressure, that means that you still have debris in those tubes and that the pressure of the, of the unit is not getting all the way through the unit. Thus, another pass, whether the second pass or a third. This is completely safe to be under there. You can take a look at this as it moves. And then once it moves from side to side, you should be able to get next to that clean area or adjacent to that cleaner area. You should be able to see through it, the sunlight through it, to give you a good indication that the ACC unit has been cleaned thoroughly. This is just another picture to show you how it is set up on the side of the unit. You can see it's braced on the bottom. It's also braced on the top. And it runs the entire length of that unit, the steam hole. Up at the top, uh, it takes all the way to the top of that unit. And the carriage being near the top of that picture. This is the only time where you should have anybody at all that is needed to go on the unit. And that is what doing the setup. So as they set the unit up, they take the safety measures required, bring up the ladder in order to get that unit set. Once we have that in place, all personnel will be down on the street level, and that unit then can run independently. But you can see how that rides, how that sits on this particular unit. This unit can also be set up for horizontal applications. So if you have an air-cooled condenser or a cooler that is flat, a flat surface, this unit can be set up to clean those surfaces. Now, there are some implications or some uh, designs where it's not applicable. Maybe you have the fan on the top of the unit and the amount of space between the fan and the fins is very small. Uh, in those applications, you may not be able to do it. But as long as there's an adequate space to mount the equipment, a flat, a flat cooler can be cool, uh, cleaned using this same methodology with the same effectiveness uh, as you would on an ACC uh, or a vertical. Now, what kind of cleaning results are you looking for? What do you expect to see? The picture to the left should be familiar. We saw that before. That's the one where I said, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that some air is getting cleared. If you look in the center bottom of that picture, you can see that's completely plugged. And that is the unit that we're going to be cleaning. The center picture shows the cleaning process. And you can see that the pressure of that water is getting through. To the right of that picture, you can see where the fouling in those units is still occurred. That hasn't been cleaned yet. But if you look at that picture on the top, the center and left, you can see where those fins have been cleaned. And you can see the difference. And it is a market difference whenever you do the cleaning. The filing gets removed, the tubes become much cleaner, and when you're said and done, they look almost brand new like you would on the far right-hand side. So that is the type of cleaning that you are going to be looking for whenever you do uh, an ACC cleaning with an aluminum machine. Now, what kind of performance improvements? We've, we've gone through the process. We know what the filing mm -hmm. is. We've gone through the process now, and we have cleaned those tubes, and we've got an effective cleaning, whether it be a one pass or two pass. What can you expect as the owner? You can expect now more airflow going through the unit, so you can increase the efficiency of the ACC unit itself. You now can reduce the speeds on the fans because they're not facing that resistance, which means that you're putting less pressure on the fans and on the ACC unit and its structure. So that reduces the maintenance costs in the long run for that particular unit. It also allows you to increase generation capacity if you've lost any. And this is a situation where, in many cases, you're losing one or two megawatts, maybe more. You bring the unit down, you're able to clean fan by fan, and you can get that, that megawatt capacity back. And one thing to remember, on many of these units, you need only to shut down the fan of the side being affected. 
So as the unit is being cleaned, if you had 15 fans in your air cold condenser, you may shut down one or two only while you clean that particular area, while you allow the rest of the unit to run. And you can then bring the fans back on as you move downstream and begin to clean the rest of the NCC unit and the rest of the fans. So you're able to gain these megawatts back while you're still cleaning the unit. So it is not something that takes the entire unit to be cleaned to begin to see results. You can see results as soon as that particular cell is clean. So air-cooled condensers, they're viable. They're a good alternative to steam surface condensers in many applications. We do see more and more of them every year. There's an ACC users group that's available that we go to. We see more people there every year uh, that either are building them, operating them, or, or are in design. Because they allow the plant to be built on sites, otherwise they can't build them. They allow them to expand in areas where they can't expand because of water problems. It allows them great flexibility. But because the way the unit is set up, because it's outside in space, because it's pulling in all the debris and all the loose sediment from outside up into those fins, you have to understand the fouling tendencies and you have to put together a an effective cleaning operation, whether that be once a year, twice a year, or whatever it mandates for your particular site. And I will say in many instances, we see plants that do cleaning and they do it on a specific regimen, regardless of the problems that they're facing throughout the year. So be open to the idea that maybe you want to clean this in the spring, and then maybe do another cleaning in the fall. If you are in an area of the country or if your unit is sitting in a location where you do accumulate a lot of fouling, because the more air you can get through that unit, the more effective and efficient it is. And those performance improvements lead to money in the pocket. So that's it for the cleaning side. I went through a lot there. And if anybody has any questions as we move forward, I'll answer them at the end of the session. But now I want to talk a little bit about leak detection. Now let's think back just a tad as those pictures that I showed you, the size of this unit. And it's sitting outside and it's being hammered by all the weather conditions that are out there. And it's going to be somebody's job to come in there and say, I have a leak here, and this leak is greater than my air removal section can handle. I've got to find the leak and repair it. Here you go. Move forward. It's a task. And we're going to talk about that now. So why do we have leak problems? Why, do, why would we inspect? Same as a steam surface condenser, because the air removal section has, does not have enough capacity to remove the air from the unit itself. Most instances, we get emergency inspection. What happens is that you recognize that you have a leak, that it's impacting the unit, that you're not getting the efficiency and effectiveness you, you need out of that unit, maybe you're losing megawatts. And we get this frantic call. When can you be here? I need you now. Come out as soon as you can and find this leak. And in many instances, that's the case you run into. We understand that. But we're also seeing a lot more on an ACC unit as compared to a steam condenser, where the ACC operators are now having routine inspection. What do we mean by routine? Well, in a lot of cases, it's before the unit comes down, before you go into an outage. We're going to call up the, the leak detection contractor to come out and take a look so that they can identify where the leaks are. And trust me, you have leaks. Every unit has leaks. Steam surface condensers, ACC units, you're going to have leaks. The ability to catch them before they become major is a key to keeping the efficiency of the plant run. So before you go into an outage, if you come in and you can do a routine inspection, to find where that small leak is 
before it becomes a major move, could be a huge plus for you. Now you've gone through your outage and you have changed gaskets, you have tightened on bolts, you've done the torquing on the bolts, you've put in insulation. What have you missed? Now would be another great time to do a leak check just to see if everything is tightened down as you wish. Before you begin using that unit and you're in the middle of July and you recognize that there is a leak somewhere and the unit is incapable of maintaining the back pressure that you need. And so that is a great reason to get somebody out there to take a look on a routine basis, scheduled basis, to make sure that the unit is done efficiently and effectively. Now, in most instances, almost every instance, 98% of the time, we use helium. Helium is a primary tracer gas. It's relatively easy to get, relatively inexpensive. It's got some great qualities, quick and reliable, and toxic, and hazardous. You don't run into EPA issues. It's very sensitive, one part per 10 million above background, suitable for what we say most lakes, and that's just because you don't want to say we can catch them all because maybe one or two slip. But helium is a great gas. It's the one recommended and the one used in almost every instance. The setup of these units is the same as the setup for a steam service condenser. Normally, in a steam service condenser, we're inside the plant, we're sitting on a crate, and we've got the analyzer sitting on a bucket, and maybe we've got a makeshift table. Out on the ACC unit, in many instances, we, we settle up in the back of the car. There is no place to really set it up, so we pull the car up close to the ACC unit, and we set up the analyzer and the equipment inside the car itself, and that's not a problem at all. We are perfectly capable of doing that. The equipment is very mobile, very easy to use from that standpoint, and we can set it up and be out there close to the unit before we begin the process. Now, what do we need from you? Well, like any leak detection process, we need steam flow. Why do we need steam flow? You can read these as I go, but I'm just going to summarize them. The steam is what drives the helium throughout the system. So as we inject the helium into the system, the steam is what moves it. It's what moves it through the system. It's what moves it to the leak itself. It's where it goes so that we can find the leak. It gets to that particular hole or crack so that we can see it. The second thing it does is it makes sure that that helium doesn't stay in that area as a, as a pocket. And so you don't get a bad reading on how big of a leak that is. It moves the helium through. The helium goes into the leak and then it goes throughout the system. And then it also clears that gas out completely. So now we come back to our baseline. So our analyzer is able to see the leak, get the information that it needs, and then clears it out and gets back to its recovery. So it's absolutely essential to have steam flow. We recommend 15% at a minimum in order to make sure this operates properly. And this is what a typical leak response looks like. You have the gas release down on the bottom left hand corner. Of course, you have the response and the time. Frame. And the technician out in the field releases the gas. And then the analyst back sitting at the analyzer gets that initial response. And at that point in time, they are in contact with radio. He says, stop where you're at. I'm getting a hit. The rate of response magnitude of response will tell them how big this particular crack is or hole, what's the leak, what's the capacity of that leak, and then we have our clear out time. The steam is now driving the helium out and we run it back down to the baseline. We can see the amount of time it takes to clear out. We can see the amount of time it takes to hit the magnitude, the maximum height of the response, and now in the Bottom right-hand corner, you can see that there's a printer here. We're able to get that printout, and we're now able to say to the person in the field, it appears this leak occurred 30 seconds ago. Backtrack, start there, 
and then they can work to find the link they can print them. So it's critical that we have the leak response time, this information, and the printout so that the analyst and the technician can talk to each other to make sure that they find the link as quickly as possible. Here's this huge unit out there. You walk up, pictures in the very front showed you that truck and the size of that truck against that ACC unit. And you're telling the analyst, hey, we got a leak up there somewhere. We got to go find it. Where do we start? The first key is make sure that you have an experienced crew. You want an experienced ACC leak detection crew that has got many hours finding leaks on your unit, or else they're going to be there for days looking and may never find it. An experienced crew has a discussion with the plant. And in that discussion, they have a series of questions and answers, dialogue going back and forth that gives that crew an idea of exactly where the problem is. In many cases, air and leakage is actually found below the fandom. And so that's where a lot of this leak detection starts. And after a discussion with the plant, in many instances, that's where they begin the process, below that fandom. Because sometimes it appears that the leak is up on the on the streets, up above the pandemic, when in actuality it's not. It's below, it's underground level, it's one of the components that are below. And so an experienced crew is able to know after that discussion where to begin the process. Understand this too. The basic setup of the equipment is the same, but boy, we've got some real issues here. A lot of leak locations are 50 to 75 feet in the air. That creates a challenge. A lot of stairs, a lot of individual streets to navigate. That creates challenges unto its own. So you want to make sure that this experienced group knows your situation and that the team that you bring in is not intimidated by the large volume of this unit itself and where to begin. So how do we go about doing it? How do these individuals go about doing it? Well, there's a couple of things that are used, a couple of tools that are used in order to make this possible. There's extensions to the shooting probe, ladders, sometimes scaffolding. Sometimes you definitely need scaffolding if you're going to have to go to the top of the ACC unit, depending on your particular design, to get to those particular areas. We do have a, an advantage here in that helium rises, so we can test a lot or a majority of the ACC unit as the helium rises, we don't get it pocketed inside the middle of the unit itself, it'll get to the top. We want to make sure that when you go into these units, because they can have different levels, you can have three or four different uh, levels of fins. So you want to spray the tubes both on the outside of the tube and then go into the A-frame itself and spray them on the inside of those tubes in order to make sure that you find the leak and where it's at, on which bundle are you looking at. Sometimes we can use a thermal gun. Thermal guns can speed the process of identifying the exact location, again, depending on your particular application. Or if you have a very large ACC where you can wall off or shut doors and isolate fans, you can do a gross shot of helium within that unit and that can speed the process up also. That has to be a specific application. So where do we find them after we get out there? Where, do this is, where does this experienced crew begin to look? Well, most leaks occur at the That shouldn't be a surprise. Think of that. You've got this unit out there, and here comes the wind. Here comes the weather itself. You've got this thaw. You've got this freezing. You've got the contracting and the expansion of the metal. You've got the wind blowing against it. Where are we going to put the most pressure on this particular unit? At the tube joints. So most leaks occur at tube joints. We find a lot of leaks at the air removal section. We find a lot of places the hogger valve and the ear injector have leaks. Why? Because they're outside. Again, susceptible to the weather itself. And that hogger valve seat sometimes doesn't properly close. It could be that over time, the thaw and the freeze has distorted that particular uh, seat itself, 
Maybe you have some debris in there, maybe the screen that you have over that hogger valve itself has, has deteriorated and you now have debris in there, but in many instances, we run into the hogger valve. Cracking at the tube welds at the base and the apex of the unit itself, um, bundled weld leaks, anywhere you have a weld, that is a potential uh, point of a leak because that's a pressure point. Any place that we attach two pieces of equipment, whether it be piping, whether it be the structure itself, that's going to be a weaker point. So, again, Mother Nature plays its role, and you can get bundled weld leaks. And then the exhaust off and the bellows leaking. You can run into those also. Again, very exposed. Some of these exhaust ducts are completely exposed outside of the ACC unit itself, and you can run into leaks on those particular units. Now, these are just some pictures I'm going to go over just to give you an idea, show you what we're looking at and what we do. Here's a hogger valve. You can see that it is below fan deck. You can see where it's sitting outside. See the fans above it. Remember, the fans are bringing all this debris in, they're pulling that air. As that debris comes in, could it get into that hogger valve? It very well could. Can Mother Nature play a role and freeze that up and distort that seat? Yes, possible. So we always take a look at the hogger valve. Here's an interesting one. This is a steam one. We have a lot of insulation around this. Uh, and rather than say, well, we know there's a crack somewhere there, let's just take off 30 feet of insulation. We're able to go in, find the leak, find where the crack is, and only remove the insulation that's necessary in this place. We had an 18-inch crack, so we were able to uh, repair that. They were able to repair that. And then only replace maybe two feet uh, area of that insulation, getting that unit back up and running. Now, here is the technician down on the street level, and here he is using the extension. That extension, you can see, goes about two-thirds of the way up. We do have them longer. In some instances, depending on your particular application, we can reach the entire top of the unit itself. But some of these newer units, which have very high, uh, 35, 40 feet, that may be difficult. And so in those instances, we may need a ladder, may need some sort of scaffolding with the extension in order to get it up there. We're here checking the bottom of the bundle, the connection points, the bottom and the apex of that particular unit. That's where you can find a lot of leaks. Here we are making sure that we're checking the bottom of this particular unit, and then that person, that technician, will go on the inside and check the inside of that unit. This is an interesting one because we run into this a fair amount. A problem has been found and maybe it was found years ago. And uh, in order to get the unit back up and running, there was a quick repair. And the quick repair was to remove those fins and then to put some sort of coating on there, patch on there, in order to seal that particular unit. But what happened in this instance is that although you sealed that particular problem, you have now created a point of stress right at where you right where you fixed it. And so now that stress point is cracked, and it has no support there. They've cut out all those fins. And so every time we go out to a job, we take a look at temporary repairs, which turn out to be permanent repairs over time. We look at those particular areas to look for stress cracking. Many times we find it right there. Here's a base weld leak. Uh, I showed you two slides ago with the technician going along the base. We particularly found one. It's the leak on the bottom of the unit, not surprising. Here's a leak on the exhaust duct, and you can see this is where the exhaust duct is welded into the unit itself. And that's a stress point. That's the stress point from Mother Nature just moving that unit back and forth, and that weld then got a crack in it, and that crack caused the leak. Sometimes the leak is outside the unit itself. Here's an exhaust bellow. You can imagine where this is sitting. It's difficult to get to, but there it is, and we've got some we've got to get out there to find that scaffolding may be required. Maybe we can use our extension rods in this particular instance, but experienced ACC people know that, hey, that could be an area where we have a leak in this particular instance. We've also found on ACC units that rupture discs are vertical. Many of them are designed with vertical rupture discs. 
And unlike the horizontal rupture disk that we see on most steam surface condensers, we find a lot of leaks on the vertical rupture disk. They, they tend to have more problems than the horizontal ones. And so if you have a vertical rupture disk, that will be somewhere that an experienced technician will know and say, listen, we've got to get to that point somehow, either climbing up under that catwalk or extension rods or else some sort of scaffolding or ladder. Get up there because there's an excellent chance that we may have some leakage. In many instances, when you go to the northern plants and a lot of northwestern plants where the terrain is relatively flat, the air is coming down from Canada, it's brisk and it is cold, and it hits the northwest corner of the unit, we will see that the same units, the same streets, the same area will be leaking year after year. And that's because as that cold air comes down and that drastic change from high temperatures, which in many instances, I'll use Montana as an example, many instances you're into 100 degrees and then you, within six months, you're at minus 30. That type of temperature differential can cause great havoc on the equipment itself. And it's difficult once you have one leak to try to repair it and have it hold up. So we find that that leak occurs again. So again, talking to the plant itself and have them be able to tell us, oh, we've had this before, this is where it is, gives us a good idea of where to begin. This is just a picture of an innovative repair. Uh, this was one where I'm sure uh, we had a leak, we wanted to get the unit back in line, so let's make this creative repair to get this up and running. And when we are able to come down, we'll fix it. And four years later, we've still got tie wraps wrapped around this particular unit here. The ideal place to look again to make sure that that is not the source of our leak. So the technique, tracer gas leak detection. It requires qualified and experienced technicians if you want to get the job done quickly, efficiently, and effectively, and find the leak or leaks that you have. If you experiment with people that are not experienced, you may be there a long time and never find what you need. In the last decade, with the advancement of more and more ACC units and the experience level of these technicians come up, they have come up with some sort of standard methodology for these inspections that they're able to go through and find these leaks very quickly. And it becomes a very cost-effective method to maintain the efficiency of your particular unit. So with that said, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your patience. Hopefully we said something that is of importance to you. And I'm open now for questions. Thanks a lot, Gary. Another great presentation. We appreciate it. Um, let's get rolling to the Q&A. Uh, we've got a question here. We'll, we'll, we'll get to leak detection first because there's a there's a long list of uh, of uh, water wash questions here that we'll have to get into. Um, can you tell us how much time it typically takes to inspect the ACC for a two-on-one S-class combined cycle? Uh, yeah, well, a lot of that will depend on where the leak is. We're talking leaks, right? Yep. Okay. A lot of that will depend on the type of operation you have in the unit itself. But in many instances, we are one to two days to find that, that leak. Um, again, the amount of information that the plant has uh, can be uh, expressed to the technician, and uh, the technician can find that leak rather quickly. So I'm going to say one to two days in order to get that, that found. Uh, and uh, relayed back, and that, that would be finding the major leaks on that particular unit. So it's a relatively quick process. We can get it up and down pretty quickly. And does Conco offer services to eliminate uh, the leaks found? Uh, we do not repair the leak. That would be uh, that would have to be on under the plant operation. Uh, mainly, that would that usually takes some sort of welding or uh, somebody coming out with torque wrenches. Uh, or some other repair to the unit itself. We are, uh, we are the leak detection agency, but we do not repair the ACC unit. Okay, 
Okay. Uh, on to the automated cleaning systems. What's your guess on the percentage of ACC owners that have automated cleaning systems? You, okay. I'm, I'm guessing what they what they're asking is the number that have them already installed. Uh, depends how old your unit is. The older units, and I'm talking units that are uh, 10, 15 years old, did not have them on. We didn't see many units like that that had the uh, automated systems. The newer units come with the option of uh, buying an automated system. Uh, I would say that probably 50% do. And of those 50%, uh, some of them don't operate as well. You have to be very careful when you choose an automated cleaning system. There's several out there. Uh, you have to take a good look at them, do your research to make sure that the one that you are purchasing, like anything else that you buy, is one that will facilitate your needs and will operate effectively and efficiently and with your personnel. So uh, we see a lot of them out there. Some instances, we get hired to come out and provide the manpower to use the system that is already installed. Uh, and in many instances, that's very possible. And in some instances, uh, we actually have to bring our own unit out and we use our own unit in order to clean that particular condenser because the, the one that's installed, for whatever reason, it could be that it, it was damaged, it could be that uh, it just wasn't uh, maintained properly or whatever, it's just not functioning properly. But I'd say maybe 50% now. You see a lot of the new ones, uh, new ACC units with uh, that on there. A lot of people buy that. Okay, and how often does a typical owner operator uh, operate the system annually? Most instances, I would say uh, the owner operator doesn't, uh, doesn't do most of the cleaning. They usually bring somebody in. I would say 20% of the time the owner gives it a shot. But, you know, these ACC units, these plants have limited manpower, which is uh, is becoming more and more prevalent. And so do they have the people available to go up and clean that unit? That's a question for each individual plant. Can you do it? You could, but do you have the manpower? And do they remember how to make the unit work as well as possible in order to reduce the amount of time it takes? when they only do it once a year. So that's something each plant has to answer. Most instances, somebody is called in to either operate the plant equipment or uh, for us to bring our own equipment in to do the cleaning. Okay, what is the metric most often used uh, to indicate time for cleaning? You can clean. Um, if you had a unit that was approximately, say, 30 to 35 feet high, face area, and maybe 260 feet long, so if you take a look at that, that dynamic, that would take like a shift to do that size. So how many of those do you have? If you've got a large unit uh, where you have uh, eight streets, then you're going to take a look at each side, and if you only run the one shift, then you're probably looking at about... 16 shifts to get that done if you're looking at those dimensions. Um, you're going to look at about a half a shift to get the equipment set up, and uh, there isn't much time flipping them from side to side, the unit back and forth, but uh, you're probably adding an, an hour a unit or something like that to do that. So you're looking uh, at 35 by 260 feet, you're looking at about a shift for one pass. Okay, we've got a few questions here on uh, whether what's the ideal pressure uh, of water for cleaning, and is there a minimum uh, water supply pressure for tube cleaning? Not so much on the pressure. We need 48 GPM for, uh, for the unit to operate properly. The pressure itself is going to be uh, added by our pumps, the pumps on there. So we will need uh, at the by and large, you're going to have to get about uh, somewhere around uh, 1,200 to 1,500 PSI out of those nozzles. But we can generate that if you can get us about 48 uh, GPM. In many instances, we use the fire line water, uh, the plant fire line water. Uh, in some instances, the plant has other water sources that we can use. So but we'll bring the pumps to get the pressure up to you. 
Okay, um, as seen from the photos of the automatic cleaning system, water is sprayed in the opposite direction of the airflow. How is full cleaning achieved? Well, what the main reason for that is just the geometry of the system itself. I mean, could you do it the other way? You could, but basically when, you're, when the air is blowing up and the debris into the fins, you're going to see in many instances, you're going to have the heavier layer of fouling from the underneath out. So you're just driving it back down through. And that's what you want to do. As that debris is driven down through, it then falls down onto the unit itself and underneath. And from one of those pictures that I showed, I, I was showing how you have some equipment underneath. That's something that you've got to take uh, note of is that equipment able to handle the water that comes down? Is it capable of handling all the debris that comes down? If not, you may want to cover it, but you want to use the force of the water and gravity in order to drive that debris down through that unit and then out the bottom. If you shoot it the other way, then it's going to, you're going to blow it out through the unit, but it's going to fall back on the fins themselves, and you're going to have to somehow close that off in the fins. So that's why you want to do it. Those are the two basic reasons, because the debris coming from the bottom to the top, you want to drive it back down through and then use gravity in order to get rid of all the debris and all the fouling that you remove from the unit. Okay, uh, should the water that's uh, for the automatic system be treated prior to use? Um, and is there a special chemical recommended for this? No, there is not. It is water and only water. We do not use any spray. Um, there is no treatment that we need on the water itself. Uh, it is, uh, like I said, we can use the fire line. Uh, we can use uh, whatever source you have. We would probably recommend that it doesn't come uh, from a lake or something like that because uh, you could have a lot of debris in there that will plug up the pump. But the water, it's just water. And so we do not have any additives. We do run into situations, though, if you have a plant, and, and there are several, that are located uh, near maybe a petroleum plant or some plant that has uh, some sort of oil in the air, that can get pushed into the unit itself. That can come and coat that particular ACC and coat the fins. In that instance, you may want to get a biodegradable uh, wash and you spray it on, you leave it on for a specific period of time, and then you use your high pressure water, just water again, to drive that through. In some locations, you have to capture that water if that's the case, in others, you do not. Okay, um, are there any special considerations for cleaning and inspecting uh, induced draft style AC fluids? No, not that I know. Um, that would probably be from a from a cleaning perspective. Um, it would be the same because it's it's a rather simplistic process of driving the water through the fins. Uh, take into account, regardless of what type of unit you have, take into account that whatever is beneath that particular panel is going to get wet. Uh, and there's quite a bit, as you saw from that one, which is quite a bit of water that comes through there. So make sure you have, you have to make sure that what is beneath that is not going to be impacted by that water. And so some instances uh, that may come into play, not many, but some. Okay, what's involved in upgrading a manually cleaned ACC to the automatic system, and how long does a retrofit typically take, including testing and calibration? Okay, now, that's an interesting question. By manual, I'm guessing that, that they're talking about either using a fire hose or using uh, a high-pressure lance and somebody manually going to clean it. So an automated system, uh, depending on the type of system that you have, is going to require uh, an attachment to the unit, and that, and that one picture you saw how it lays up on that unit itself. Typically, we attach it to like an I-beam or a runner up by the steam header. We can attach it at the bottom of the unit itself, like a C-clamp or a C-channel, and you see clamps down there to hold it in. 
it is not a long process unless you need rail to be purchased and rail to be installed at the top of the unit. If you have, if you have an older style ACC, that may be required. And in that instance, it's a matter of going up the ladders, making sure that you're safe, running a safety line, and then attaching the C channel at the top. And that can be that can be a process. But um, otherwise, it's relatively easy to set up. Uh, when we bring a unit out, we're talking a couple hours, or maybe an hour, two hours, in order to get that up on that unit and run it. And then to flip it over, it takes anywhere from one, 30 minutes to an hour to flip it over on the side. So it's not a very, very difficult process. Okay, uh, water consumption is a, is a big concern for a lot of owner operators out there. Um, can you talk about how the automatic system compares versus say the fire hose or the lance in terms of uh, consumption and efficiency? Yeah, the automated system, we need 48 GPM. And so you can sit there and figure out pretty quickly based on the size of your unit approximately how much water you're going to use, and it's consistent because the automated system is going to be on, a, on an automated timing schedule riding up and down that particular rail. So you can slow that down or speed that up based on what you need for your unit, but you're looking at 48 GPM. When you use a high-pressure lance or when you use a fire hose, that's going to be completely independent of or dependent upon the person that's using it. So um, how thorough do you want to be? How thorough is that guy with the fire hose going to be? How long is he going to spray that hose? And how much pressure do I have or how much GPM do I have coming out of that hose? That's all very dependent. And you could have the same unit, same fire hose, two different technicians on two different days and have double the amount of water. The effectiveness of the automated system far exceeds uh, that of the fire hose and the hand lance because it's consistent, because you get the proper angle at all times throughout the entire unit, because there's no damage, and because you're able to remove all the debris uh, as you go up and down that rail cleaning that particular unit. And that, that's not going to be possible with a human being trying to climb along. Do you know if the uh, spent water wash that's, uh, you know, that ends up on the ground has to be collected or and processed and sent anywhere after the cleaning? That is an excellent question. In 48 states, they say no, because it's just water and what's being removed from the fins came from the ground to begin with. It's the pollen, the dirt, the leaves, whatever. Uh, and it's just plain water that is being blown down through that unit and then is being uh, dispersed across the ground. There are two states right now, I can't say that there may be more, but there are two states right now that require you to catch that water in some form and then truck it away. And there's nothing you need to do with the water, but that, that, that's the rule of that particular, those particular states. So you do have to check with your locality and your state to see if that's a requirement. Okay, if the only source of uh, water available is demineralized, uh, is it okay to use that for the cleaning process? Yeah, yeah, you can use it. A little expensive, but yeah, you can use it. That's no problem. Okay, uh, we've got one more question regarding uh, helium leak detection. Uh, one owner operator had helium leak detection performed at his sites, uh, and the inspector reported leaks in terms of a number of divisions. He'd like to know what, it, what is a division? Is it some type of unit or uh, of measure? I'm going to have to research that. I've never heard it uh, reported in terms of division. Usually you report the leak based upon where it is. You'll say there's a there's a weld leak at the base of the unit, like I had shown in that one picture, or maybe you'd say the weld leak is at the exhaust. But I'm not I'm not exactly sure what they mean by divisions. But uh, um, I can look into that, and I can get back to everybody about what that is.
All right, everyone. Well, that's it for the questions here. Um, if we did miss any, uh, the, the people at Comco will be contacting you and going through all the questions that came in through the chat on the, on the webinar to uh, answer in more detail, um, and that'll be in the coming weeks. Uh, at, at the end of this week, we'll be posting a recording of today's presentation so that you can share that with other members of your organization. Uh, we'd certainly like to thank Gary again for this great presentation, and we will see you soon. Thanks, Gary. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Scott.